Any, okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining at Apostle Rebina. My name is Jim Moyang, current Apostle. Last year, we made Apostle Rebina more active than the ASLD and the EASY. We got more than 30 times Apostle Rebina near every Saturday. I sincerely thanks to Professor Omata, Professor Sarin, Professor Joji Rao, Professor Tanwandi, and Apostle Training Committee members. This year, we have a little change in pattern. We are going to do in depth about the topic of river disease once a month at Friday. We look forward to your continued participation. So, I'd like to introduce our webinar program director, Professor Yong Song Lim, who is at Asan Medical Center from Ulsan University, Korea, as a chief of Apostle Webinar Committee. And I'd like to introduce today's webinar moderator, Professor Jia Hong Kao, as we are known. National Taiwan University of Taiwan, and Professor Antonio Bottoriti, also as well known, is a work at Duke Annual Medical School of Singapore. Professor Bottoriti, please. Yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm extremely happy to to be here with you to to discuss and to open this uh, very interesting webinar which is focused on understanding better this immunotolerance phase of hepatitis B. So the title of this webinar is Immunotolerance Phase, a remaining battlefield against hepatitis B virus. Um, we have a, a fantastic list of uh, very important speaker. And I will start uh, uh, immediately to, to present the first speaker, that is Professor Lee. Professor Lee, is working at the Department of Internal Medicine at Seoul National University Hospital. And uh, he, sorry, and he's going to present uh, a case presentation, a case for middle-aged men in the so-called immunotolerant phase of chronic hepatitis B. Um, after this uh, talk, there will be uh, a talk uh, that has been registered by Professor Henry Chan, and then uh, my co-chairman will introduce the other speaker. Uh, Professor Lee, if you want to start your presentation, uh, we are very happy to listen to your case report. Professor Lee, please unmute. You are mute. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to present a case of middle-aged man with chronic hepatitis B in so-called immunotolerant phase. I have no conflict of interest regarding this talk. The patient was referred from a local clinic five years ago. He was a 46-year-old gentleman and had chronic hepatitis B, which was vertically transmitted from his mother. As he is a Korean, his HVV would be genotype C with very high probability. He was undergoing regular surveillance for HCC every six months with ultrasonography and blood tests. He showed persistently normal ART with very high HVV DNA level. He uh, there was no familiar history of either liver cirrhosis or HCC. So he was still an antiviral naive patient. This slide shows the result of initial laboratory test. His LFT profile is completely normal and specifically his ART level was 25 units per liter and quite normal even according to strict ASLD criteria. His HEBE antigen was positive and serum HVV DNA level exceeded 100 million in a national unit per milliliter, and his HBS antigen tire was very high. Predated count was also within normal range. 
stringent erythrography showed that he didn't have any evidence of significant fibrosis. This graph shows the changes in ART and HVV DNA levels during follow-up. As shown in this purple line, his ART level was persistently normal. And as shown in this green line, his HVV DNA level was persistently very high beyond 1 million in a national uniform milliliter, although the level was gradually decreasing. His most recent fibroscan test showed he still did not have significant fibrosis. So I believe he was literally still in immunotolerant phase of chronic hepatitis B. Although his age was relatively high, but technically it is not a rare case in Korea where the genotype C HVV is predominant. So I did not start antiviral treatment for him. I'd like to ask several questions to speakers regarding this case. First, was he in a true immunotolerance phase and didn't he have any worrisome feature? Second, did he have a negligible risk of HCC development? Third, what are your recommendations for him? Will you recommend antiviral treatment at that time? Thank you for your listening and I'll get back to you to show the clinical outcome of this patient after inspiring lectures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lee. Very, I would say, concise but precise presentation. And I think now we are starting with uh, the lectures of this webinar. Uh, the first lecture is actually a recorded video. Unfortunately, Professor Chang could not uh, attend, and, uh, but he sent exactly this, her, his presentation. Uh, a brief introduction of Professor Chan. Professor Chan, for the people that do not know him, do not own, know him, is uh, uh, the head of the Department of Internal Medicine and the Division of Gastroenterology at the Union Hospital in Hong Kong, and is an expert on the treatment of chronic hepatitis B and chronic hepatitis C. Uh, I, I don't know who is going to start this video uh, because I'm not able to start it, but I think the secretary can start the video of Professor Chan of his presentation that is entitled, uh, Is uh, Immunotolerant a Distant Clinical Phase in Chronic Hepatitis B? From the Chinese University of Hong Kong and Union Hospital Hong Kong. Today, my topic is immunotolerance a discrete clinical phase in chronic hepatitis B. Immunotolerance phase is characteristic by high HPSG level, high HPV DNA, positive yin antigen, and normal ALT. And this is classically seen in patients who acquire HPV infection at infancy. And usually Asian patients have this immunotolerance phase in the first 20 to 30 years of life. The definition of immunotolerant phase by ASLD is E positive, HPV DNA more than seven log IU per mil, normal ALT level, and no evidence of liver fibrosis. So for many years, this has been a phase um, uh, described among Asian patients, but in recent years, there are lots of controversy whether it is a real discrete clinical phase, and some people even challenge whether it's an immunotolerance phase in chronic hepatitis B. So in today's talk, I'm going to focus to discuss on three areas. One is a natural disease progression. Second is the risk of liver cancer, XCC. And third is the response to enteral therapy. And based on these three areas, we're going to dissect the question whether there's a real discrete phase, at least clinically, of immunotolerance in chronic hepatitis B. So for the natural history, the most important question is whether there is disease progression in immunotolerance phase. 
So I will focus on five process progression in immune tolerant patients. The controversy on whether immune tolerance risk exists actually comes from a lot of histologic data. So this is only one of the weird examples. This is a histology series of Asian Americans with positive yin engine, normal ALT based on ASLD criteria, and high DA levels. So by definition, these patients should be in immune tolerance. But on liver biopsy, we found that 25.7% of them have F2 to F3 fibrosis. In other words, these patients may have significant fibrosis and are not in immune tolerance. So lesson to learn is we cannot just base on serology, biochemistry, and virology to define immune tolerance. Histology is important. And therefore, ASLD, APASO, and ESO all recommended that we should think about advanced fibrosis in E positive patients if they are older. So definition of older ranges from 30 year old at ESO to 40 year old at ASLD. So we still do not know which cutoff age we should use. But in principle, if a patient is E positive at an older age, there is a chance that he or she has already gone into immune clearance. But the biggest AOT level actually fluctuates or is mildly elevated at some time, we may miss it and misclassify these patients as immune tolerance. Liver stiffness measurement by fibro scan is actually an excellent tool to exclude liver fibrosis in E positive patients, particularly in suspected immune tolerance patients, because these patients have normal ALT. In the patient of normal ALT, we are pretty confident that a patient has no liver fibrosis if the liver stiffness is below 5 kilopascal, and are pretty comfortable if the liver stiffness is below 6 kilopascal. So nowadays, we do not need to puncture a needle into a patient's liver to diagnose immune tolerance. Looking at the natural history of immune tolerant patients, we have reported a case series of 65 immune tolerant patients, and we have paired fibro scan um, at the three year interval. We found that only 31, 3.1% uh, of them had liver stiffness measurement by 30% or stepped into the advanced fibrosis range. And this is a very low, very low percentage and is comparable to the immune active patient being treated by nucleotide, nucleotide analogs. So in this study, we concluded that the disease progression in terms of liver fibrosis is very slow in immune tolerant patients as defined by the antigen, AOT, and DNA criteria. Another study um, looking at a paired liver biopsy at five years among 48 patients, only three of them had fibrosis progression, and the worst one only progressed to F2 fibrosis. Four patients with F1 fibrosis at baseline had fibrosis regression back to F0. Overall, majority of patients have F0 fibrosis or F1 fibrosis on liver histology, again confirming that clinically, if a patient is in immune tolerance phase, we can expect that the fibrosis progression is very, very slow, and most patients can have a minimal fibrosis at a five-year interval. So putting together, I think, looking at fibrosis uh, progression, there are really patients who are in a phase of immune tolerance with minimal fibrosis progression. So the second aspect we're going to look at is XCC risk. Immune tolerant patients have very high DNA by definition. Does the high HPV DNA translate into a high HCC risk in immune tolerant phase? The importance of HPV DNA and HCC is illustrated by the review study. So these are all previously untreated patients with hepatitis B 
and we know that the risk of cirrhosis and HCC increase exponentially as the HPV DNA goes beyond four lox copies per mil. So in immune tolerant patient, by definition, they should have DNA more than seven log IU per mil. They should be at a very, very high HCC risk based on review study. But when we go back to the review study, so this is a Taiwanese patient cohort followed for more than 11 years. Most patients are aged beyond 40 year old. Only a third of them are between 30 to 39 and none of them are below the age of 30. So this is too old for immune tolerance. 85% of them are E negative. So these are not typical the E positive patient and most patients had normal ALT. These patients are usually non cirrhotic putting things together. Patients in the review HPV cohort are largely older, inactive, inactive, happy patient, but they are not immune tolerant patients. So we should not over interpret the results of review HPV cohort into the natural history of immune tolerant patients. Anyhow, this cohort has been used to derive a commonly used score called which B score. So we excluded all patients with NXCV uh, antibody, we excluded all patients with liver cirrhosis. And then the important factors that can predict XCC was derived. A rich B score is, is determined and is subsequently validated by three independent external cohorts from CHK, Yonsei University, and University of Hong Kong. Overall, gender, age, AOT, E antigen and DNA levels were found to be important factors predicting XCC, and the risk score was derived based on the weight of each factor. For immune tolerant patients, they can be male or female. The age should be younger. So the youngest age in this category is 30 to 34, which gives a risk of zero. AOD should be normal, must be E positive, and must have high DNA level. And putting all together, these patients should have a risk score of six to nine. Now, if you look at the three and five year risk of liver cancer, the risk among this category is actually very, very low. We should not focus too much on year 10 because some patients might have broken immune tolerance into immune clearance and some may have active disease by then. So anyhow, if you look at the risk B score, the risk of liver cancer among immune tolerant patients should be low. However, there are controversy on whether the immune tolerant patient have a higher risk of liver cancer than a treated immune active patients. So this study comes from Korea, 415 immune tolerant patients with no treatment versus about 1,500 immune active patients on NA. And it found that the immune tolerance group have a higher risk of liver cancer and higher risk of death at liver transplant as compared to the treated patients. But when we interpret this study, we should be a bit careful because we look into the detail. The risk of HCC among immune tolerant patients is very high. It's much higher than all other reports. The mean age of immune tolerant patients in this study was 38 year old, a bit too old. 28% of immune tolerant patients had DNA less than seven locks and this did not fulfill the ASLD criteria as immune tolerance. And in this study, they found that high DNA was associated with a lower risk of liver cancer. So probably the real immune tolerant patient had a lower XCC risk. So we need to interpret this uh, study uh, with some caution. If we look at the Taiwanese data, in fact, we know that for E positive patients at immune tolerance to start with, they will undergo spontaneous E cell conversion. And most patients undergo this procedure before the age of 40. And it's only among those who failed to undergo yeast conversion at age of 40, they had a higher risk of cirrhosis uh, and disease progression. So lastly, I'll touch on response to NMR therapy. So does immune tolerant patient respond differently to NMR therapy as compared to the immune active patients? So this is a summary of one year response 
among E positive patients to antagonist TDF and PET interferon alpha 2A in the pivotal retrocessional trials. So, in general, with the first line oral antiviral, we should achieve somewhere around 70% DNA suppression below 60 to 80 IU per mil and E cell conversion of about 20%. With PET interferon alpha, we expect an even higher E cell conversion rate of 32% at the end of one year. So what happened to immune tolerant patients? So this is a randomized control study, a multi-center study looking into E positive patients with high DNA normal ALT, randomized to four-year treatment of either TDF monotherapy or TDF plus emprostatabine therapy. The response was assessed at week 192, and we found that 55% of patients on TDF had DNA less than 69, a little bit lower than that in the pivotal uh, trials, but the point of note is a very low rate of E3 conversion. So it seems that even with viral suppression, the host immune system is not activated and there's no yeast cell conversion, and the rate is much, much lower than what we see at the end of one year uh, by the TDF, which should be about 20%. When we stop the drug per protocol at the end of four years, all patients had viral relapse, and the relapse was very, very fast. Most patients had relapse in within four weeks, and half of them had also clinical relapse with AOT more than two times up to limit of normal. So how about PET interferon? So there are studies looking into the combination of PET interferon plus antagonist in immune patient. So this study reported a one-year study of this combination among 28 adult patients who are E positive, high DNA more than seven locks, and AOT less than 1.5 times of the normal. In interestingly, E cell conversion rate is again very low. It's only 4%, so much lower than what we expect for PEC interferon monotherapy, which should be somewhere around 30%. And a similar study was conducted in children, 60 children, among uh, also at immune phase, high DNA, normal AOT, and E positive. E cell conversion rate, only 3%. So very, very low as compared to immune active patient. And all these studies suggested that immune tolerant patients have a different response rate to oral antiviral therapy and a PET interferon. And the key difference is a very low E cell conversion rate indicating the immune system cannot be activated to clear antigen no matter we give oral antiviral therapy with or without PET interferon. So with all this evidence, I would like to summarize that clinically, there is still a discrete immune tolerance phase. These patients have very slow fibrosis progression. They have a lower HCC risk than immune active patients, and they have a poor response in terms of E3 conversion and DNA suppression to antiviral therapy. And things will only become different if immune clearance check in. With that, I really thank you very much for attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, okay, I, might, I can listen my here. Thank you very much, Professor Chen, for your presentation. I think now uh, we should have uh, the presentation of uh, Professor Patrick Kennedy. And I think my co-chair, Professor Cao, can present, but I'm not sure whether Professor Kennedy is here now. Somebody knows, because otherwise we can skip and go to Professor Lin. Uh, it's me. Uh, uh, is uh, Professor Kennedy online? Not yet, sir. So maybe, uh, maybe we show his video. Okay. So uh, he sent the video. Okay, that's great. So. Uh, so I will I would like to chair uh, Professor Kennedy's talk. So I think uh, thank uh, thank you uh, all for attending this uh, hepatology webinar uh, by uh, Apostle. And uh, as uh, Professor Henry Chen mentioned, 
uh, there are some uh, controversies about the immune tolerance phase of uh, chronotype B. And therefore, uh, we are very uh, fortunate uh, to uh, invite uh, the Professor uh, Patrick uh, Kennedy uh, from the United uh, Kingdom. And I would like to uh, briefly introduce uh, Professor uh, Kennedy. I think uh, Professor Kennedy is a consultant hepatologist uh, at the Bath Health NHS uh, Trust. Uh, he was graduated uh, from University uh, College uh, Dublin and uh, completed his uh, postgraduate uh, medical training in gastroenterology and hepatology in London. And he was appointed as a clinical uh, senior lecturer in hepatology at Bath and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry uh, since uh, 2009. And this evening, uh, Professor uh, Kennedy uh, will give a talk about the uh, chrono uh, hepatocyte expansion, host genome integration, and the immune dysfunction in immune tolerance phase uh, chronotype B. So uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Professor Kennedy. So Izumi, can you uh, play the video? Thank you very much. Distinguished Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great uh, honor and privilege for me to join this important APASL webinar on immune tolerant chronic hepatitis B. I remain in battlefield against hepatitis B in my talk this evening. We'll discuss clonal hepatocyte expansion, host genome integration, and immune dysfunction in the immune tolerant phase chronic hepatitis B. But this is a subject that I'll be coming back to talk a little bit more on uh, as we go over the, the talk. Firstly, I don't need to tell anybody here about the great challenge that we face in terms of chronic hepatitis B, the huge belt, uh, health burden hepatitis B represents. We know that deaths from hepatitis continue to rise and specifically hepatitis B. More worrying, I find, is the number of uh, chronic hepatitis B infections and the disparity between that and hepatitis B diagnosis, where we think there's only 27 million people diagnosed. It's alarming that there are so many people who've yet to be diagnosed, where we know the failure to diagnosis will lead to progressive disease and, of course, progressive disease leading to development of chronic liver disease, cirrhosis and HCC, as I show you on the bottom panel here. We're also very acutely aware of the great unequal burden of hepatitis B across the continents with Africa and, of course, Asia representing the major areas where the challenge would be greatest. This is a slide on the global impact of HCC, and I think there are a couple of key numbers here that we're all familiar with and it's worth revisiting. I think the take home here for me is the 800,000 deaths per year, but more worrying than that is the 10 to 25% lifetime risk for the development of HCC in patients with hepatitis B virus. As this persists, it represents a failure in our ability to diagnose patients and treat them, and indeed to change our treatment strategies to improve these outcomes. So this really underlines the fact that we have much work to do to address the challenges of hepatitis B as we go forward. This is a slide that is often used looking at untreated chronic hepatitis B and HCC risk. But I think the key factor here is untreated chronic hepatitis B. Even if you look at the host factors, uh, the male sex, age over 40, family history, and where you're born, be that Africa or Asia, we know that we are still able to address some of these factors. So for example, we could treat earlier, uh, and by treating earlier, we may be able to modulate some of these outcomes. Similarly, in the viral and disease factors, we know that cirrhosis is a significant risk for the development of HCC. Again, this is a failure of diagnosis, a failure of, of intervention to prevent getting to this stage. But similarly, elevated HPV DNA, elevated ALT in patients diagnosed, and this is identified, treatment should be able to modulate this and improve outcomes. The next important element to consider here is when you look at the natural history and disease phase of chronic hepatitis B. Classically, we have these four disease phases, formerly referred to as the immune tolerant phase, now referred to by easel as E-antigen positive chronic infection. Then we have the E-antigen positive chronic hepatitis phase, uh, 
formerly referred to as immune active, E antigen negative chronic infection or immune control, and E antigen negative chronic hepatitis or the immune escape phase. Although these four classical phases, we still only offer treatment in two of these phases, of course, and immune tolerant patients are largely excluded from this. However, in recent years, we're seeing some progress or changes in our understanding of the disease where we're considering uh, the possibility of treating immune tolerant patients. And of course, this is what this webinar is focused on today. This is something that I've talked about for a number of years and many of my colleagues here likewise, and why those reasons that we should consider early treatment in chronic hepatitis B. There's been a lot of work here, and this is where I'll start by addressing some of this work as we go forward from ourselves and other groups. But importantly, if you start at the starting point, the question of why should we consider treating immune tolerant chronic hepatitis B, I mean, put simply, I would say that this disease phase is not benign. There's evidence of clonal hepatitis ex expansion and HP HPV DNA integration in this phase of disease. And you also have seen from the title that we refer to immune dysfunction uh, in the immune tolerant phase. But in fact, I would argue that there may not just be, I think, a simple interpretation of immune dysfunction. I would show you that their virus specific T cell responses are preserved. And conversely, that this may actually be a good window of opportunity to consider treating patients. From a public health perspective, we have the possibility of reducing the pool of HPV infection and risk of viral transmission by treating young people, which sometimes I think is also overlooked in this debate. Looking at some very simple clinical uh, markers when you look at immune tolerant chronic hepatitis B, this is from our publication with Bill Mason in 2016 in gastroenterology. And what we showed here that when you biopsy young people of the same age, all in the second or third uh, decade, that really, if you looked at the ishak fibrosis stage, we see virtually no difference in those labeled immune tolerant, E-engine positive immune active, or those with E-engine negative immune active disease. However, sometimes we think that maybe the ishak fibrosis stage may not provide a more precise insight into fibrosis and to, to liver damage. So if we look at collagen proportion areas, I show you on the top right here of this slide, again, you will see in terms of serous red staining, there seems to be little difference in the degree of liver fibrosis, suggesting there are similar levels or at least some degree of immune activity causing this damage within the liver. This is an area that I find fascinating because we get to see less and less livers uh, by reduced access to liver biopsy tissue. But if you look here, you will see on the left of this graphic, I'm showing you an immune tolerant liver biopsy. And on the top on the left here, I'm showing you that it appears that the immune tolerant patients are characterized by a greater degree of core, uh, nuclear core positive staining. And as you move across the various disease phases, what you're seeing a shift in this staining of viral antigen, with a greater increase in the degree of surface antigen staining. And on the right of this, you've seen the ground, classical ground glass appearance that we see in chronic hepatitis B with significantly higher levels of surface antigen positive hepatocytes in both E antigen positive immune active and E antigen negative immune active patients. But going back to the immune dysfunction part of the title, I think this is an important slide because when we looked at this at the very start, this is work with Antonio, that was published in Gastroenterology in 2012. And it's a very simple concept that if you look at immune activity or uh, immune exhaustion, and you're looking at markers of PD-1 positive CD8 T cells, we're showing you here on the left of this slide that in e antigen positive chronic infection or immune tolerant patients, degree of immune, immune activity is really no different to that with e antigen positive chronic hepatitis, significantly higher than that in healthy controls. But more importantly, maybe, is what you're seeing on the right of this slide, that as patients get older, moving through the decades, it would appear that there's a greater degree of immune exhaustion, uh, meaning immune dysfunction. And as these patients get older, it's likely that they may respond less well to treatment. Many of you would have seen this uh, figure before. I've shown it in previous talks. This is from the work published with Bill Mason in 2016, showing you in the top left here in patients as young as 15, the presence of clones, uh, clone hepatocyte expansion in an immune tolerant 
patient population, which is essentially no different to that in E antigen positive chronic hepatitis patients shown on the top right. We also showed as patients got older and moved through disease phases, it's possible that those clone sizes in, are increasing. And on the bottom right of this slide, I'm showing you that in the E antigen negative patients, clone sizes do appear bigger, but the clone sizes are maximal in those patients with uh, the development of HCC. And this is just showing you in terms of clonal hepatocyte expansion that we think that this is probably an immune driven phenomenon and it is more than just natural death and turnover but probably immune mediated and as we see as you go forward with more degrees of uh, immune activity into the E antigen negative immune active disease we've seen the greater uh, size of clones. In terms of frequency of HV integration, we looked at this. This is the term by endpoint dilution followed by inverse nested PCR. There are various techniques now to look at integration, but if you look at the frequency of total integrations per liver and the minimum frequency of distinct integrations, we see virtually no difference across the various disease phases from immune tolerant, immune active, and immune active E antigen negative chronic hepatitis B. Moreover, we see significant levels uh, be, be beyond the significant levels that we see in all disease phases, we also see that H3 integration is a random event into the human genome. This brings me to an article in 2018, just to kind of look at the chronology of this, where this opinion piece put forward the possibility of treatment, what treatment was doing, the treatment over time will reduce CCCDNA, but raise questions about the ability of treatment to reduce integrated HPV DNA. But interestingly, in the same year was this landmark publication from Korea uh, looking at early treatment and how it may impact outcomes. Now, if we went back to those initial classical disease phases that I showed you for measles, you will see here that in the purple representing the chronic infection group or immune tolerant, if untreated uh, versus those with immune active disease, we see a greater accumulative instance of HCC development. And similarly, we see greater death or transplantation in the untreated immune tolerant group. This is a slide I'm sure we're going to be referring to again over the course of the webinar and discussing in more detail. But this brings me to 2020 to some very important and exciting new data which is emerging around integration and treatment. This is looking at how tenofovir reduces the number of transcriptionally active viral integrations of chronic hepatitis B. And essentially these studies all focus on paired liver biopsies, looking at baseline in this case, and then a year three follow-up. And while there's very little difference uh, at baseline and level of HPV DNA, and in the level of integration expressed as, as uh, expressed integrations per million reads, at three years, we'll see in the Tenofovir group here shown in green, there is a significant reduction in the number of uh, integrations per million reads. And this translates to a full change in integration reads into the Sinophila group, a statistical significant full change in those patients on the subsequent uh, biopsies. In this slide, I've merged a um, number of these studies as shown at ASLD uh, with the Chow data and previous data of ours. And I'm gonna show you here on the left that nukes nuke therapy can reduce clone size and downstream effects of, of integration. So in the study from Chow, they showed very nicely that after one year of treatment, there was a significant reduction in the hepatic, hepatocyte clone size. However, they had a smaller group of patients, uh, five patients who were biopsied at 10 years. And in three of those five patients, there were no integrations detected at 10 years. All of these studies draw on uh, various techniques using RNA sequencing to gene map HV integration events. And what we've shown and others have now shown is that HPV integration frequently involves genes involved in cell proliferation, antiviral and inflammatory responses. Importantly, however, dysregulated protein coding genes, some of which are, are, are cancer related, underline the biological importance of these integrations. And what these recent studies shown at ASLD show very nicely is that nukes can reduce viral genomic perturbation and the downstream effects of integration. This brings me briefly to 
our recent publication in gut, uh, looking at engine negative chronic hepatitis B, where we show whole exome atrial integration was present and independent of the intrahepatic HPV reservoir. And I showed this just to underline that beyond the uh, intolerant phase of disease, we have to think more about these other quiescent phase of diseases as we move forward in terms of managing chronic hepatitis B and trying to reduce the number of deaths and uh, the risk for the development of HCC. However, HB integration, I think, is an area which we'll focus much more on in the coming years. In this cartoon I'm showing you here in the top of the graphic, the large transcriptally active intrahepatic HPV reservoir driving uh, liver inflammation, disease progression, and the development of HCC. But similarly, we must focus on the bottom half of this slide to better understand integration and how that contributes to HPV-driven tumor genesis. Identifying important integrations in different subpopulations will be a key challenge over the coming years. Will we be able to draw on serological markers? This was from our paper in gut, showing that high levels of surface antigen in the antigen negative patients highlighted important integrations which can be associated with pathological events. We'll need to draw on these data and focus more on identifying uh, potential markers which will identify patients who are at risk of integration in HCC development. This brings me back to the whole question about immune dysfunction, immune tolerant chronic hepatitis B, and what's happening over the course of chronic hepatitis B. This again is a, a, a collaboration with Antonio, looking at a large number of patients. You'll see from the top of this um, slide, 197 patients, and I'm showing you here the quantity of surface antigen in the top panel. Um, and we all know that surface antigen decreases, of course, over the lifetime, the natural history of chronic hepatitis B. But in fact, what this slide shows, importantly, that it's less about the quantity of surface antigen, but more about the age or duration of chronic hepatitis B and how that is impacting the virus-specific response, and in particular, the HBS-specific response. Let me draw your attention to the bottom of this slide here, where I'm showing you the HBS-specific response, which is present in approximately 30% um, uh, represents approximately 30% of the total HPV specific uh, response in those aged under 30. And you'll see as we move through various age ranges at the bottom of this um, panel, you'll see that the HBS specific response begins to disappear. And as you get to over 34, we know that the HBS specific response accounted for only approximately 7% of the total HPV specific response with the core and polymerase response being um, emerging as stronger responses at this stage. I think what this slide shows us is that the duration of infection is a key factor here in terms of the, the disappearance of the virus-specific response leading to uh, immune dysfunction. Finally, I'll return to the concept of um, the immune dysfunction in the immune tolerant phase of chronic hepatitis B. And I just point out this article that Antonio and I wrote a few years ago, where we looked at uh, the various disease phases in the immune tolerant phase, E antigen positive chronic infection versus the E antigen positive chronic hepatitis. And we're all again very familiar with the immune tolerant phase where we get high levels of HPV DNA and normal levels of ALT before there's a shift or a change in disease to this more inflammatory element where there's the antigen positive chronic hepatitis, at which point we th consider this to be the ideal uh, time point to offer treatment. But this can be looked at in a different way where the E antigen positive chronic infection or immune tolerant phase is a more non-inflammatory phase of the disease. And this may actually be an ideal time to consider uh, certain treatments and certainly some of the novel therapies which are being considered as part of functional cure, where this may represent an ideal environment, in fact, to maximize on the uh, host immune response to lead to better treatment outcomes. And I'm sure this is something that we'll come back to over the course of the discussion. So finally, this leaves me with my concluding remarks um, uh, for, for this webinar. And I'd highlight that our understanding of uh, the immune tolerant phase of chronic hepatitis B has evolved in recent years, has evolved rapidly. In fact, we've demonstrated and many groups have now demonstrated clone hepatocyte expansion, hatred integration and events associated with hepatic carcinogenesis are present. We know that the immune tolerant phase uh, 
um, may provide an ideal immunological window of opportunity for novel HPV therapies, but the data that we've seen today and data we'll see later over the course of the webinar, to me and I think to many now makes a compelling case that we should consider treatment of immune tolerant chronic hepatitis B and we should be treating these patients earlier to avert disease progression and development of HCC. And I would argue further that we should be including immune tolerant patients in the clinical trials as part of the functional cure program as we go forward. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion uh, uh, later on in the course of the webinar. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the very excellent presentation, Professor Kennedy. So uh, let's uh, move on uh, to the uh, next uh, talk uh, delivered by uh, Professor uh, Yong Su Lin. So I think the, uh, most of us uh, know uh, Professor Lin very well. Uh, he's very famous in our region. And Professor Lim is now the professor, Department of Gastroenterology, and also the di Director of Clinical Trial Center of Assam Medical Center and the Vice Dean uh, Research Affairs of the University of Assam, the College of Medicine. So today, uh, Professor Lim will uh, give us a talk entitled The Clinical Outcomes and the Cost Effectiveness of Antiviral Treatment for Immune Torn Phase Chronitis B. So Professor Lim, please. Thank you very much, Professor Kao, for kindly introducing me. Um, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to share our knowledge with the audience uh, through this Apostle webinar. The current practice guidelines recommend that moderate to severe necroinflammation or fibrosis should be used as an indication to start antiviral therapy as determined by liver biopsy or elevated ART levels in the presence of high HVV DNA levels. Those recommendations may be depicted by this simplified figure in the e antigen positive non serotic patients who do not receive liver biopsy. Most of the current guidelines recommend to initiate antiviral therapy after identifying elevated ART levels, even with high HPV DNA levels. The most controversial subgroup of patients are those who have high viral load and persistently normal ART levels which may include immune tolerant phase patients. These patients are not the candidate for treatment by current guidelines. However, a recent Korean retrospective cohort study conducted in 3,600 treatment naive chronic hepatitis B patients showed that high proportion of patients is developing HCC outside uh, outside the current uh, treatment recommendation for chronic hepatitis B. Among those who developed HCCC, as high as 64% of the patients were outside of the treatment guide criteria of APASL guidelines for chronic hepatitis B. These data may suggest that maybe we are missing many patients who could prevent HCCC by earlier antiviral therapy. In these regards, we may first have to address the question regarding whether immune tolerant phase chronic hepatitis B is really safe. Earlier study by Professor Kumar and Sarin analyzed the distribution of hepatic fibrosis stasis in Indian patients with persistently normal ART levels. Surprisingly, almost 40% of the e antigen positive patients had significant fibrosis stasis despite persistently normal ART levels. These data suggest that persistently normal ART levels are not very well representative of normal liver histology. We may also have to consider that HVV is an oncogenic virus. Hepatocarcinogenesis could be underway even without significant fibrosis in chronic hepatitis B patients. Independent of the inflammation cell death, fibrosis, cell regeneration pathway, integration of the viral products into the host genome, and the clonal hepatocyte expansion may cause hepatocyte chromosomal instability followed by HCC occurrence. In fact, the famous reveal cohort study from Taiwan have clearly demonstrated that higher HBV DNA levels 
are associated with higher HCC risk. Regardless of ART levels and uh, HBE antigen status in non-serotic chronic hepatitis B patients. In this study, the risk of HCC was highest with HBB DNA levels above six log copies per ml, which is around five log IU per ml. These data suggest that so-called immune tolerant phase chronic hepatitis B may not be so safe from the risk of hepatic fibrosis and HCC. In the immune active phase patients, loop treatment have been consistently shown to reduce the risk of HCC. In these many studies, the reduction of HCC risk by treatment was about 50 to 60%. However, until recently, it has not been uh, clearly defined whether earlier treatment in immune tolerant phase chronic hepatitis B could reduce HCC risk. Therefore, we analyzed the data from about 2,000 HBE antigen positive non serotic patients with HBB DNA levels above 20,000 IU per ml at Asam Medical Center, Seoul, Korea. The clinical outcomes of untreated immune tolerant phase patients with persistently normal ART levels were compared with those of immune active phase patients treated with NUC for elevated ART levels. In the propensity score matched analysis, untreated immune tolerant phase patients, as indicated by the red line, had a significantly higher risk of HCC and also death or transplantation than treated immune active phase patients. The 10 year estimated cumulative instance of HCC and death was about 2.5 times and 3.4 times higher in the untreated IT phase than treated IA phase patients. These results suggest that the patients considered to be in so-called immune tolerant phase do have a significant risk of HCC and disease progression. And the earlier initiation of antiviral therapy before ART elevation may prevent many unnecessary deaths from HCC and the liver disease progression. As expected, the risk of clinical events in incrementally increased with the increasing age of the patients, especially when the patients were older than 30 years. Interestingly, in this study, in these untreated E antigen positive patients, decreasing HBB DNA levels were associated with increasing risk of clinical events. The risk of clinical events was significantly higher with the baseline HBB DNA levels between 4 and 7 log IU per ml, compared to those with very high HBB DNA levels of over 8 log IU per ml. Therefore, we had a question whether we could stratify HCC risk by baseline HBB DNA levels in the E antigen positive chronic hepatitis B patients. By integrating all the data from the untreated E antigen positive and E antigen negative patients, we comprehensively analyzed the association between broad range of HBB DNA levels and HCC risk in about 7,000 non-therotic chronic hepatitis B patients without significant ART elevation. Baseline HBB DNA level was above six log in about 2,000 of the patients, comprising 30% of the total patients. By multivariable analysis, HCC risk was highest with the baseline HBB DNA levels between six and seven log IU per ml and was lowest with above eight log and below four log, which was independent of other predictive factors. In this study, E antigen status and ART levels were not significant factors predictive of HCC. This nonlinear parabolic association between HBB DNA levels and HCC risk was consistently observed in all age subgroups below 40, 40s, and above 50.
In this study, the risk of HCC was highest with moderate HPV DNA levels around 6 log IUPML, even without significant ALT elevation. In these regards, current practice guidelines are worrisome because they classify many of these high-risk patients as to be in immune-tolerant phase, not recommending treatment because of the normal ALT. Our clinical findings may be explained by the theory of clonal hepatocyte expansion. Host immune attack to the hepatocytes infected with HVV may alter cellular phenotypes and result in appearance of hepatocytes with a survival advantage devoid of the virus infection, which leads to the uh, gradual decrease in serum viral titers. These hepatocytes with a heritable survival advantage may clonally proliferate, and some of these hepatocytes may have pre-neoplastic changes, which eventually initiate the development of HCC. In fact, another study showed the expansion of clonal hepatocytes devoid of woodchuck hepatitis virus after long duration of the infection. These studies suggest that the slow decline in serum HVB DNA levels may represent the progress of clonal hepatocyte expansion and increase in HCC risk, which is very consistent with our clinical findings. The case we are discussing today also showed slowly decreasing levels of HBB DNA over five years of follow-up, reaching to six log IUPML without significant worsening of hepatic fibrosis and persistently normal ALT levels. However, with this level of HBB DNA, the patients may have the highest risk to develop HCC. We also wanted to address the next question regarding whether the increased HCC risk with moderate HVB DNA levels is reversible by nuke treatment. So we analyzed the data of about 2,000 E antigen positive patients treated with entecavir or tenofovir with baseline HVB DNA levels of over 5 log IUPML. In the propensity score weighted analysis, the risk of HCC in these treated patients incrementally increased with lower baseline HBB DNA levels. The patients who initiated the treatment with baseline HBB DNA level of 5 log had six times higher HCC risk compared to those with baseline HBB DNA levels of 8 log. This pattern was also identified by propensity score matched analysis. These data suggest that increased HCC risk with decreased HBB DNA level is not completely reversible by long duration of nuclear treatment in E antigen positive patients. In contrast, initiating nuclear treatment with high HBB DNA levels above A log may maintain the lowest HCC risk over a long time. Next, we gathered all the data from all E antigen positive and E antigen negative patients and analyzed the outcome of the untreated and the treated patients by baseline HBB DNA levels. Very interestingly, the association between baseline HBB DNA levels and HCC risk during follow-up was almost identical in both untreated and the treated groups, which was a non-linear parabolic pattern. The adjusted risk of HCC was the highest with HBB DNA level around the six log in both groups. When the HCC risk hazard ratios by baseline HBB DNA levels in both groups were combined in a single plot, the HCC risk was significantly reduced in the treated patients with moderate baseline HBB DNA levels compared to the untreated cases. However, this risk did not decrease to the level of those treated with baseline HBB DNA levels higher than A log. Next, 
These findings suggest that if we delay the treatment until the decrease in HBV DNA levels, the increased HCC risk is not completely reversible by NUC treatment in E antigen positive patients, even though we could reduce the risk to a certain degree. In contrast, initiating the treatment with high HBV DNA levels above A log may maintain the lowest one therapy HCC risk. Then we addressed the next question regarding whether earlier treatment at IT phase is cost effective. This study was published online in GUT recently, and we designed a Markov model to compare starting antiviral therapy at immune tolerant phase versus delaying the therapy until active hepatitis phase in chronic hepatitis B patients over a 20 year horizon. A cohort of 10,000 non cirrhotic 35 year old patients in immune tolerant phase chronic hepatitis B with the mean serum HBV DNA levels of 6.7.6 log IU per ml and the normal ALT was simulated. This slide summarizes the incremental cost effectiveness ratio ISER by the annual rate of HCC. The base case were assumed, was assumed to have an annual HCC instance of 0.7%, which is below the willingness to pay threshold in Korea and is therefore cost effective. Overall, the results suggested that the IT, treat IT strategies was increasingly cost effective compared with the untreated IT strategy in patients with a higher annual instance rate of HCC. Especially from a societal perspective, considering productivity loss by premature death, the treat IT strategy was extremely cost effective and was dominant with the ISO value below zero in most cases, suggesting that treat IT strategy incurs less cost than the untreated IT strategy. Another most influential param parameter on cost effectiveness of the treat IT strategy was drug cost. With the decrease in cost of the nukes in the forthcoming years, the cost effectiveness of treatment in the younger IT phase patients could be further improved. Then we in next examined the impact that expanding treatment would have on the future disease burden on the population level in Korea. Three scenarios were developed and compared to the base case, which maintains current eligibility requirements and the treatment levels through 2035. First, expanding the current guidelines to include all cirrhotic individuals regardless of HBB DNA levels and treating 70% of them. Second, reducing ART levels uh, to upper limit to normal rather than two times upper limit to normal and treating 70% of those eligible. Third, treating 70% of all individuals with a high viral load above 2000 IU per ml, regardless of E antigen status and the ART levels. Treating 70% of patients with a viral load above 2000 IU per ml, regardless of ART and E antigen status, had the greatest impact and was estimated to avert 43,000 cases of HCC, about 10,000 cases of decompensated sources, and save 37,000 lives until. 2035 in Korea only. One of the concerns in treating immune tolerant phase is the infinite duration of the treatment. However, currently many, many new novel drugs are under active development to achieve the functional cure in the patients and expected to become available in five or 10 years. Therefore, I optimistically expect that the patients may not need lifelong look treatment. So to summarize my talk today, immune tolerant phase chronic hepatitis B patients are not so safe 
decreasing HPV DNA levels, especially to 6 log IUPML, is associated with increasing HCC risk in e antigen positive chronic hepatitis B patients. Delaying duke treatment until ART elevation may cause the decrease in HPV DNA levels and the increased risk of HCC in these e antigen positive patients. Increased HCC risk with decreased HPV DNA level is not completely reversible by NUC treatment in E antigen positive patients. So, initiating NUC treatment with high HPV DNA levels above A log may maintain the lowest HCC risk for a long time. The treat IT strategy is increasingly cost effective with a decreasing drug cost. If we treat 70% of the patients with HPV DNA levels above 2,000 IUPML, regardless of ART levels and E antigen status, we could avert uh, 43 cases of HCC and save 37,000 lives uh, between 2020 and 2035 in South Korea only. Therefore, a new simplified treatment decision guidance may be suggested recommending the initiation of treatment if the patients have HPV DNA levels above 2,000, especially when they are older than 30 years, regardless of e antigen status or ART levels. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you very much for your informative talk, uh, Professor Lim. So uh, then, uh, we, we will have uh, a panel discussion after all this presentation. So then I think I would like to invite Professor Ali uh, to have the case summary. Professor Ali, please. Okay. After five years of fire off, uh, um, a new mass was eventually detected on ultrasonography during regular surveillance, as Professor Lim was afraid. His river dynamic CT scan showed about four centimeter size single nodular HCC at segment six, as shown in these pictures. There was no evidence of splenomegaly at that time. His laboratory test shows still normal ART, HBE antigen positivity, and high HBV DNA level around 6 million in a national unit per milliliter. His operative count is still normal, and his alpha beta protein and PIPCA2 levels are also within normal range. His tumor was clinically diagnosed as BCRC stage A HCC and I recommend him to start antiviral treatment and to undergo surgical resection. He underwent laparoscopic right posterior sectionectomy. As you can see, there was a large tumor here. This slide shows microscopic features. In this picture, left side is tumor and right side is non-tumor liver parenchyme. Tumor was well differentiated carcinoma HCC without any vascular invasion. When you look at the non-tumor tissue, there was mild inflammatory activity as shown in these lymphocytes around pori triad and surprisingly, there was significant fibrosis graded as metavir fibrosis grade two. So in summary, a middle-aged male patient with chronic hep B had been undergoing regular surveillance for HCC without antiviral treatment. He had persistently normal ART, high HVV DNA level, and no evidence of significant fibrosis according to the result of transient elastography. So he had never met the criteria of antiviral treatment except for age and never got chance to start antiviral treatment. Unfortunately, he developed an HCC and uh, his background river showed histologically significant fibrosis. Thank you for your attention.
very much uh, for the uh, case uh, summary. And then uh, we have completed all the presentation and we would like to uh, take the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, actually, we have a few uh, questions uh, there's, uh, from the audience. Uh, maybe I can ask some uh, questions uh, to uh, Professor uh, Kennedy and also uh, Professor Lim. So, considering uh, the treatment duration uh, for immune torrent quantized B patients, so what's the end point of the, the therapy? Because for e positive patients, uh, the, the several international guidelines also recommend uh, we can treat until e uh, loss or e gene serial conversion uh, with one year of uh, consolidation. However, for uh, immune torrents, chronic diabetes patients, should we treat them uh, lifelong, as you mentioned? And in addition uh, to that, uh, you also mentioned that there, there may be some uh, novel anti-HPV uh, drugs will be available in the coming years. So what kind of uh, such drugs in your mind? Please. Um, well, I'll go first because I think um, uh, Professor Lim and I have very similar views on this. I think what's been clearly shown in the case presentation very, is very nicely shown and, and, and the, the presentations today have shown very nicely is there is significant risk of, of HCC in these patients. And if we have to start treating these patients earlier and treating them with uh, nukes to virally suppress them, we are certainly shifting them into a safer category where there's reduced risk. Uh, like Professor Lim, I, I have a lot of optimism in the drugs which are currently in development. And if these patients are started on a nuke in their late 20s or early 30s, I think there's a strong possibility that we'll be able to offer them novel therapies which will be added onto the nuke therapy further down the line, which may be possible to achieve surface antigen loss. And, these are patients who are relatively younger with less uh, fibrosis, scarring of the liver. So theoretically, they're an ideal group of patients who could discontinue therapy downstream, for example, if they were to achieve surface engine loss. But I think that the data and the, the various presentations that we've seen today do really make, uh, every time you look at it, it makes a more compelling case to offer these patients treatment early because straight away we're reducing their risk. And I think if patients understand that better, I think up until now, maybe that hasn't been communicated to them necessarily by the community, but by taking an antiviral and suppressing the virus, they are going to be in a safer place with reduced risk of, of disease progression and development of HCC. Uh, yes, uh, to uh, answer uh, the question by uh, Professor Kao, um, I can say that we have many, many classes of new novel uh, drugs that can achieve functional cure in chronic hepatitis B patients. Uh, those drugs are classified into two uh, classes. The number one, direct acting antivirus, and the number two, immune moderators. And uh, the direct acting antivirus include uh, small interfering RNA drugs and the uh, capsid uh, protein allosteric modulators and um, other kinds of drugs and um, entry inhibitors including also. And also the immune modulators, we have uh, therapeutic vaccines and um, uh, TRR7 or 8 agonist, etc. So um, these many, many drugs are under active development and are in mostly phase one or two or phase, clinical trial phases. And um, some of the, of the drugs may enter phase three trials in uh, one or two years, I, get, I expect. And um, we can uh, use those drugs in first coming five or 10 years. So um, we can safely maintain our patients um, with nuke treatment until that time. And then we can achieve functional cure uh, later on. That's my <laughs> optimistic expectation. Thank you. Can I? Hi, this is uh, Dr. Bertoletti and I would like a, a, to make a comment that, uh, well, first, really, I really enjoy this uh, 
I would say, more clinical presentation. I think you, you know that I'm more a, a sort of basic immunology, but I really like uh, that finally there is this idea that, you know, we, we should really treat more the virus than the inflammatory disease, more, let's say, looking at the patients when they have high level of HBV DNA and not exactly only when they are high level of transaminases. I mean, I, I, as you know, I mean, this is, as Patrick uh, uh, pointed out, this was a sort of long-term battle that uh, we started 15 years ago, just to basically reporting that when we were looking at the immune response in the subject that were young uh, and they have a normal level of transaminase, we can actually find more, let's say, antigen-specific immunity. Okay, having said that, my, my question is like, uh, uh, perhaps more to, to Professor Lim, uh, that he have, uh, let's say, somehow showed to me convincingly that we need again to treat uh, patients with high level of HBV DNA. But having said that, you also said, uh, but in any case, it's better to start to treat probably when the patients are 30, 35 years old. So, so my, my question is really whether in reality we should not start to think about, uh, I know that now I'm gonna say something that probably is not acceptable, more of the chronic hepatitis B infection as a sort of pediatric disease, that maybe we should really start to treat really, really early the, the patients that are infected. And I, I don't know if, you, if we want to discuss about this, I think I'm really uh, eager to, to listen from, from you, from the clinician point, uh, what they are thinking. Yes, um, a very good question. Thank you very much. Um, actually in Korea and also in many, many Asian countries, because of the very successful universal vaccination programs in many countries, um, we have very few pediatric chronic hepatitis B patients. Um, so um, I, uh, I, I am um, uh, usually uh, taking care of those who are uh, older than 30 years in reality. And um, another um, issue to be considered is the cost effectiveness. Actually, in our cost effectiveness analysis, um, with the current drug cost, um, those who are younger than 30 years, um, treating those uh, patients was not so cost effective. However, if the drug cost decrease um, to 80% to of current cost, um, the, the, the treatment uh, become uh, cost effective. So um, I am mentioning um, waiting um, for the treatment in uh, those very young patients until the decrease in drug cost for several years only. And um, waiting um, the treatment for five years or seven years uh, was not so um, dangerous in our study in, if the patients were younger than 30 years. Yeah, so uh, Professor Lim, this is uh, really an, an excellent uh, uh, discussion uh, and uh, great to learn a lot from you. Uh, you have done a cost-effective analysis and um, I just wonder what, what is the cost of the nukes uh, you're talking about in South Korea? Uh, yes, yes. The analysis, because uh, as you know, um, you know, after all these years, the cost is actually driving the rapidly downwards. And uh, having said that, uh, the following questions is, uh, what will be the uh, uh, cost effectiveness of having a new drugs uh, as compared to lifelong nukes uh, to make it uh, really uh, attractive, attractive uh, to the public service? Uh, what will be the cost? Because then we are comparing lifelongs and I totally agree with Antonio, the earlier we should uh, treat, the better it should be. Um, but what will be the, uh, the cost? issues. Yeah, a very good question. Thank you very much, Professor Lau. Um, in Korea, the uh, monthly cost for uh, tenofovir uh, and antigavir is around um, 100 US dollars. And um, the cost effectiveness analysis should be based on the uh, uh, country situation. So our analysis uh, was based on Korea and data only. So um, 
the analysis should be done in other countries as well, um, separately. And um, um, if we have a very uh, uh, novel uh, drug that can achieve uh, functional cure in high proportion of the patients, um, it may be very expensive <laughs> as we expect. But um, we have the experience for hepatitis C, uh, uh, direct-acting antivirals for hepatitis C was very expensive for the first of several years. However, uh, mm -hmm. it is, uh, the cost is decreasing very rapidly. And um, uh, even with the th uh, such a high price of the new drugs, um, the cost effectiveness uh, showed that uh, it is much more cost effective to use those uh, drugs uh, because they can achieve uh, sustained virological response in very high proportion of the patients. So um, it may depend uh, on the uh, rate of functional cure in uh, chronic hepatitis B patients. If the drugs could achieve uh, functional cure in a high proportion of the patients, uh, even if the drug cost is very high, uh, we may uh, cost effectively use those drugs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, there are some questions from the audience. Uh, Professor Kao, do you want to read it or shall I start to read one question? Uh, I can start it, yeah. Okay, uh, I start with a question from uh, Dr. Nikolai Naumov to Dr. Patrick Kennedy. And uh, Dr. Naumov is asking, uh, first to say, thank you very much for the nice talk, stimulating idea in your view what will be the end points for treatment of immunotolerant HBV patients? First question. Second, which of the new antiviral in development will be more promising in the AIT patients? Patrick. Thanks, Antonio. Thanks, uh, Nikolai. Uh, <clears throat> I think the end point for treatment here has to be surface antigen loss. And this is where we talk about treating patients early, virally suppressing them, and you know, at a very early stage, trying to avert disease progression and risk for HCC. But this is the ideal opportunity then potentially to bring in some of the new therapies. And here specifically, I'm talking probably about the siRNAs or possibly antisense oligonucleotides to begin with, where we would envisage maybe getting rapid reduction in, in, in surface antigen and potentially benefiting from that. But I think going back to the talk, I think it's important that this is done at a very, that, that there's a finite window here. And probably the people who will, gaze, will gain the most from this are people who are younger with a more functional immune response along the lines of what Antonio just talked about. So I always struggle when there are these arbitrary ages of 30, it used to be 40, they seem to come down every few years, but I still think 30 is an issue. Uh, we showed very clearly in the publication in Gastroenterology with Antonio last year that those anti-HBS T-cell responses are disappearing after the age of 30 in the fourth decade. They're, they're, they're virtually not there. So I think we treat patients early. We're treating patients in their 20s. And these are probably the patients that we also want to consider early in terms of the functional cure program. And for me at this stage, that looks probably like siRNAs, antisense oligonucleotides, maybe in combination with capsid inhibitors. Okay, I think there's a uh, question. I think uh, like uh, Professor Henry Chen's talk, so uh, he considered that immune tolerance is a discrete uh, phase because uh, there's high DNA and young age and low risk of ACC and a poor response to antiviral therapy. So there's a question from the audience. So uh, that in some studies, uh, when uh, immune tolerance phase is more uh, strictly defined, I think as uh, defined by ASLD, so they have very low risk of SCC or cirrhosis uh, progression. And so uh, we, without, any, without treatment. So should we consider the treatment if they uh, get older, uh, when they have high HPV DNA level with normal ALT level, or should we consider other factors in addition to age? So I think the fibrosis stage is also a very important determinant. Uh, to uh, decide whether to start the treatment uh, with antivirus uh, earlier. Uh, 
So what are the suggestions from the panelists? Professor Lee? Uh, yes, um, very good question. Um, actually, the uh, uh, predictive power uh, of each uh, factors may be different. Um, and um, uh, we have many, many predictors uh, for HCC occurrence, uh, including uh, alcohol drinking and um, uh, NASH, um, the presence of NASH or diabetes and family history, etc. But uh, the uh, most powerful uh, predictor uh, for HCCC would be the uh, progression of hepatic fibrosis. However, the problem here is that um, we don't have very reliable uh, measure to accurately uh, estimate the degree of hepatic fibrosis. Even though we have uh, uh, fibroscan or non-invasive hepatic fibrosis markers, um, those uh, non-invasive measures can uh, accurately uh, predict, uh, the, estimate the uh, presence of cirrhosis. However, uh, those markers and uh, non-invasive uh, measures uh, are not so good in predicting F2 fibrosis. So um, other, other predictors would have uh, much more importance because of uh, these points. And um, uh, I, I'd like to use uh, age, uh, gender, and um, HVB DNA levels, and also platelet counts. Uh, combining those uh, parameters, we can uh, decide whether to st start the treatment or uh, delay the treatment. However, um, in doing so also, we have to uh, uh, think about the prevention, preventional value of the treatment. We are not uh, treating uh, uh, to reverse the hepatic fibrosis or inflammation. We are uh, treating the patients to prevent, to prevent the disease progression and uh, HCC occurrence. In that sense, uh, initiating the treatment earlier would be better, I think. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I so the next, uh, yeah, please. I, I don't know, we do one one <laughs> question per, per one. And there is one, I mean, actually there are many, many questions and I think we will not be able to, to let's say, answer all the questions, but there is this interesting question. Uh, do speakers think that we need a new definition for immunotolerant phase? You know yeah, what is my answer. Same <laughs> Patrick and Professor Lim, if you want to answer. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, I mean, I'll go very quickly. Um, I think, you know, for me, trying to move away from immune tolerant as a, as a, as a, as a, as, as a definition was trying to change how both physicians and patients thought about the disease. Because I think historically people think immune tolerant, they go, oh, the patient is fine. This is quiescent disease. Nothing is gonna to happen to you. And this is wrong. And this has been showed very, very clearly by the data and the emerging data. And there's a very, very strong case that we need to change the way how we think about hepatitis B and how we manage these patients. So definitely I'm in favor of, of changing uh, those terminologies in order for people to rethink what they should be doing. But, you know, the bottom line is here, the longer the people have very high levels of virus, integrating virus, inflammation that we cannot detect, uh, fibrosis that we cannot detect with tools which are not very good at, at discerning, uh, you know, these moderate or, or intermediate levels of fibrosis, there is a compelling case that we should be treating these patients. We should be treating them earlier and we should be changing their risk profile. And I think that's how we need to approach this. I completely agree with Professor Kennedy. And this is very, very important question actually. Uh, and um, um, I also uh, do not uh, prefer to use immune tolerant phase. Um, it, it's a, a kind of concept in the natural course of uh, chronic hepatitis B patients um, because of, uh, it is a very vague um, definition. Um, many, many practice guidelines 
uh, do not have a consistent definition for, for immune tolerant phase. And uh, even though we have a consistent definition for immune tolerant phase, which may be above seven log IU4 ML of HBB DNA, we may have many, many patients who cannot be defined in any kind of uh, uh, phases, um, remaining many, many patients in the gray zone or indeterminate phase. If, if please consider to uh, uh, the patients uh, who have uh, 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 five or uh, uh, seven log IU primary of HBB DNA, persistently normal ALT levels, and middle age. And uh, we cannot define those patients in any uh, phase of chronic hepatitis B. So I uh, personally uh, suggest to use uh, other, other classification of the patients, uh, low replicative phase, maybe below 2000 IU primary of HBB DNA, and um, moderate replicative phase between uh, three log to uh, and uh, eight log IUPML and uh, high replicative phase chronic hepatitis B patients over eight log IUPML of HBB DNA. And um, if we define the patients, the whole chronic hepatitis B patients in this way, we may combine the treatment strategy with the definition. If the patients have very low replicative phase, we do not need treatment initiation. If we have uh, very high replicative phase patients, we may uh, initiate the treatment to prevent uh, disease progression and HCC occurrence. Um, and uh, if we have uh, patients who have moderate viral load between three log and eight log, those patients may uh, need immediate initiation of treatment, regardless of ALT levels or E antigen status, even though they have normal hepatic histology. Thank you, Professor Lin. Professor Lee, do you want to, to say your uh, idea whether you want to change the name or not? We don't have any advocate for maintaining the term immunotolerance, and it could not be me. Yes, I appreciate, I appreciate your excellent talks. And I, now I regret that my patient may have chance to reduce the risk of HCC if I have started antiviral treatment earlier. Um, so I have one question to Professor Lim. Um, uh, I have a concern that your wonderful article, including cost-effective analysis were based on data from a few centers. And there is still controversy whether immune phase has significantly higher risk of HCC. Uh, and moreover, Korean patients are infected with genotype C, HBV, and have much higher risk of HCC compared to other ethnicity, including Caucasian. So I'd like to ask you if it would be required to gather more data to support your treat or uh, highly replicative phase, uh, phase uh, patient theory. Uh, what your, uh, can you provide me on your opinion? Yes, yes, I agree with you. Um, um, as I mentioned, the cost effectiveness analysis um, should be based on a specific uh, situation of each country. So. Um, the analysis should be done in uh, other countries um, uh, also to, uh, to acquire the generalizability of our data. And uh, as you mentioned, um, almost all Korean chronic hepatitis B patients have a genotype C, HBV, which have a, a, a little bit higher risk to uh, disease progression and HCC occurrence compared to other genotypes. So uh, I recommend other researchers in many other countries to, uh, to conduct such a cost effectiveness analysis in their country. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That, in addition to uh, base, uh, on the basis of HPV DNA label, I think the low viral load, intermediate or high viral load, as you mentioned, the low replicative, uh, moderate replicative, and highly replicative. So, in addition to that, even a patient with low viral load, they still have some uh, risk of uh, liver cancer. So in our previous publication of Serenogen uh, to uh, stratify uh, 
and the risk of ACC uh, in patients with low viral load. And we also use the core related antigens to stratify the risk in patients with intermediate viral load. So I think uh, all these uh, new biomarkers can help the clinicians uh, to have a more uh, precise uh, classification or risk stratification of patient to decide whether some patients uh, should, uh, should be uh, treated earlier. Uh, all these information are very important. So I have uh, a practical questions or concern in our clinical practice because we know uh, the young uh, people are very active. So the drug compliance may be an issue. So if they uh, discontinue the drugs, we know there are some patients have a very severe uh, viral relapse or even a clinical relapse, uh, hepatitis flare and the liver decompensations. Uh, what's your opinions? I think this is a good point, but I think that this has to come down to two things, really. It's about physician education and also about patient education, that uh, for too long that if physicians perceived, uh, you know, the so-called immune tolerant as a quiescent phase of disease, you didn't need to do anything, they didn't, co they didn't convey the potential risk to patients. So physicians, number one, need to understand what the risk is. If they do, then they can convey that risk to patients. And when patients understand the risks, they will understand in an informed way about making decision to take treatment or not. So uh, there's always the, the, the discussion around uh, adherence as a potential barrier to offering people treatment. But I really don't see that because, you know, up until now, we were not offering young people treatment. So we need to, first of all, disseminate, educate the, these kind of data to the physicians that they're in a position where they can provide the information to, to, to patients. And then patients making an informed decision are much more likely to be adherent to their antiviral in the same way that they would be to an antihypertensive or a statin for hypercholesterolemia. And that's the way we need to start thinking about it. Yeah, it would be the ideal situation, but we know in the real world, uh, these uh, best things still ha happen uh, in our clinical practice. So Professor Lim, what's your experience? Yes, um, actually we uh, also analyzed the, the uh, level of adherence in chronic hepatitis B patients to the medication. Fortunately, um, many, more, many, many of the, uh, those studies consistently have reported that the adherence in chronic hepatitis B patients is higher compared to uh, other uh, diseases, such as uh, uh, hypercholesterolemia or hypertension or diabetes. Mm -hmm. So in our series, the adherence level over five years of follow-up was mm -hmm. of around 85%. This is very high. However, uh, we may have to uh, try other measures to uh, enhance the adherence as uh, Professor Kennedy mentioned, and also, um, I, I am uh, uh, aware that some of the pharmaceutical companies are making, developing uh, long-lasting drugs uh, of tenofovir or antiquavir. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have a drug that can be taken once a week or once a month, that would be wonderful because they should not uh, uh, stop the treatment. Long-lasting drugs would be ideal in chronic hepatitis B patients. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I can ask some other questions from the audience. There are a couple of questions about the importance of liver biopsy for starting the treatment in immunotolerant patients. Some of the speakers want to, to answer this question. Patrick? Yeah, thanks, Antonio. I mean, I think liver biopsy is very important because it really gives us a lot of information beyond kind of looking at, let's say, fibrosis or necro inflammation. But I'm not convinced that we need a liver biopsy necessarily to make a decision on treatment uh, in chronic hepatitis B uh, today, even for immune tolerant patients. I think we can certainly learn a lot from it. We can do so much more with it. We can, you know, stratify disease in so many uh, different ways by, by some, of the, some of the techniques we can use in a research capacity for looking at uh, uh, liver tissue. But I, I'm, I'm not a, I don't think it's a requisite for starting treatment. And I think that would, that would also be wrong and it would probably be a barrier to starting treatment in some of these people. 
Yes, I also agree with Professor Kennedy. We have to consider the risk benefit ratio in uh, performing repeated ribo biopsy. Just a one time ribo biopsy would not uh, sufficient to decide the treatment initiation in the patients. Uh, so, but um, if we repeat the invasive uh, ribo biopsy, um, in the risk of uh, the biopsy would outweigh uh, the uh, risk of uh, taking medications for a long time. Um, if the patients take medication, um, they would be very safe and no need to do repeat biopsy. So I recommend to consider the risk benefit ratio uh, comparing um, the repeated ribo biopsy versus uh, initiating the treatment early without biopsy. Thank you very much. Uh, there is, there are, if I can ask another question from the audience, uh, basically about uh, if there are differences between different antiviral, in particular in Tecavir versus uh, Tenofovir in IT phase. Professor Lin? Um, the difference is in outcomes between different drugs. Yeah, I mean, I think the question just say whether in during the IT phase, you would probably prefer to start the treatment with entecavir or tenofovir. Yes. I'm, um, I'm just reading uh, the questions. It's a very difficult question to answer. Um, but um, uh, in my knowledge, to the best of my knowledge, um, um, Meta-analysis uh, comparing the viral response between entecavir and tenofovir, um, the virologic response was uh, higher with the tenofovir therapy. And um, in many Asian countries, many, many patients have been exposed to uh, low genetic barrier drugs such as lamivudine or uh, adifovir. And um, uh, we, with those uh, treatment experience, and Tecavir would not be a good choice. Um, but um, in, in, even, in, even with the, the uh, treatment with uh, Tenofovir, as Professor Henry Chen showed, um, the biology response rate is, was not so high. However, we have to remember that uh, most of the patients uh, can achieve uh, the decrease in virology levels below 2000. Even in the study by Professor Henry Chen, very few people, very few patients maintained uh, viral load above 2000 um, with continued tenofovir monotherapy. And so even though we cannot achieve uh, undetectable HBV DNA levels with uh, tenofovir or entecavir, uh, continued treatment uh, more than uh, two years or five years uh, may uh, lead to the achievement of viral load reduction at least below 2000. So uh, we may reduce the risk to develop HCC or disease progression. Thank you. Professor Kao, do you want to add something or? Uh, Antonio, I think this is uh, really the challenging and um, uh, having in the field for close to 30 years uh, and having the definitions of immune tolerance. This is actually the first questions I asked my tutor analog at that time, what immune tolerance phase means. Uh, and at that time, as you know, it is because uh, the treatment is interference and it is intolerant. <laughs> um, uh, to treatments and there's no response in the, to the pediatric groups uh, with e-energy positive. Having said that, uh, I would like to uh, put up uh, questions to all the uh, panelists and the speakers. What do you think about the ideas of, uh, one, of uh, rendering all the hepatitis B patient DNA negative as early as possible? Uh, and uh, with surveillance, uh, because uh, from the basic uh, clinical studies uh, done by Antonio and Patrick and, uh, and so on and so forth, and with the DNA's implications and uh, uh, integrations, uh, uh, implications, uh, 
uh, would it be uh, sensible to um, just uh, reduce the DNA to uh, undetectable level as much as possible for all hepatitis B patients plus surveillance of HCC? Uh, and while waiting for the new drugs of, uh, of, uh, of, of a service energy clearance, I would bring the best benefits uh, to our patients. It's, it's Patrick here. Thanks, George. I'm, I'm a very simple person and I believe in simple solutions. And what you're describing there to me seems like an ideal strategy to move forward. I mean, this is really about minimizing risk for patients. If we can render patients with undetectable viremia, their risk really just disappears, you know, at, at uh, full changes to moving them almost back to within the general population. So to me, that makes a lot of sense. And then we, we would basically optimize ways of moving forward with treatment. What worries me is that we will move from where we are now to more complicated strategies around patient selection and how we will do that. And by doing that, we'll miss some patients and there will be, there will be uh, uh, ongoing risk or persisting risk for some individuals. So, so what you're suggesting makes a lot of sense to me. And I think that we should have studies. I mean, um, there are not a lot of data um, uh, despite, uh, well, we have the vaccination programs, uh, universal vaccination since uh, um, 86, and uh, the young patient is getting less and less uh, antigen positive and so on. And I think that uh, maybe the classifications itself uh, need to be revisited. Uh, antigen positive, antigen negative, uh, DNA, and so on. These are the conventional biomarkers we have been using. And the Professor Kao also bring up the very important uh, issues of the new uh, virological markers, uh, recombinants, antigens, and so on and so forth. But having said that, uh, the HCC uh, occurrence uh, or the, the morbidity related to HPV-related liver cancers is, uh, is not decreasing uh, over the years of the, uh, of the compounds we have. Uh, and uh, I'm a practical person, so what is lacking in the field, maybe the, we, it's, 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 re, it's time for us to uh, rethink about the, the landscape of uh, what we have and what we should be doing. Uh, having said that, then we, uh, uh, whether the um, new drugs are for uh, an attempt of cure uh, is, uh, is, uh, is workable, because I really want to know uh, whether just reducing the service antigen itself artificially with all the compounds will bring in a cure. Uh, I want to learn from Antonio's. I mean, the, is the service antigens uh, 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 the, the only the polarizing agents for the, or, or for the immunological recovery, uh, which has to be multi-specific. Uh, I learned from you and Frank Cesari many, many years ago. I mean, it has to be multi-specific T cell response. Is that right, uh, Antonio? It is right in terms that uh, clearly if you are able to mount a very good immune response, both B and T that can actually recognize different parts is good for the control of the effect. I think to me, I mean, I'm going back to what we have been discussing here. I, I think honestly, I see the, the, the hepatitis B virus now disease first really a viral disease. And when I'm talking about viral disease, I think it's very important to first consider quantity of replication, HBD DNA and quantity of SRs. And then to me, it's back to the point to say, as early as possible. So if your question is, what do you think about the S antigen quantity? The S antigen is definitely, I would say, have immunotolerant uh, uh, generic uh, um, effect to the antigen specific T and B cell response. But it's not really the quantity, or let's say it could be the quantity, but what is really important is the fact that if you have a, a patient that has been in contact with the virus for 20 years, for 10 years, or for 50, 60 years, clearly the patients that have been in contact for 50, 60 years, they don't have any more a large quantity of T cell and B cells that are able to respond again. So that's why I would say we keep, I would say, putting now the, I mean, to underline the problem of early treatment. 
because if we are thinking that one of the important factors is really the restoration of the immunity, the immunity is a little bit more, I would say, decent in the chronic patients that have young. That's it. And therefore, I would say, I mean, I, I, I really like, I would say, today the, the discussion and the, I would say also this new concept that really go towards considering mainly HBV DNA, the high quantity of HBV DNA, which they should be treated despite the quantity of uh, uh, transaminases. Uh, I don't know, but I don't, there are actually some other questions and perhaps if I can ask a question from the audience, which I do think is important because we didn't discuss at all about E antigen positivity, the antigen negative and the antigen positive. And, and there is this question from the aud audience that is asking, is HBE antigen no more important in the clinical situation? Uh, I don't know whether Professor Lim or Professor Kennedy want to answer to this question, which I think is an interesting question. Patrick, E antigen, why we don't talk anymore about E antigen positive and negative? Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's an important question. I think that E antigen is positive because it's telling us something about the disease uh, in terms of potential response, in terms of, um, you know, potentially what you have immunologically too. I would say that the antigen positive patients have got more preservation of their immune response. And again, will likely be better candidates for um, the novel therapies and new treatments. So E antigen is positive. E antigen rather is important and um, it's important because it's another element which is characterizing patients which may inform us about their ability to respond to treatment and their ability to respond to, uh, to the novel therapies as part of functional cure. So I, I do think it's important. And, um, and similarly, we talked earlier a little bit about treating patients with who engine positive disease and consolidation therapy. If we, we know that if we achieve uh, e antigen seroconversion, that these patients, you know, tend to do better, e antigen seroconversion going on to achieve surface engine loss. So it still is important to me. It's just sometimes we move away because there's such a fixation around surface antigen and trying to uh, knock down surface antigen, but it's still important because it tells us a lot about the disease. Professor Lim, do you want to add something? Um, yes, I agree with pro uh, Professor Kennedy. And um, um, uh, in understanding the nature of course of the patients with chronic hepatitis B, the uh, presence of E antigen in the serum of the patients would be very important. Um, however, uh, in the uh, this season mm, to treat or not, um, it may have uh, a less importance um, because the outcome of the patients may be greatly de uh, determined by uh, other factors uh, such as AZ, uh, HBV DNA levels, and fibrosis stage rather than E antigen status. Um, so, in our uh, another study, uh, on treatment E antigen zero clearance was not predictive of uh, uh, clinical events such as HCCC or death. So um, it may be the indicator uh, to the S antigen loss. However, uh, we may not uh, convincingly discontinue the treatment only with E antigen uh, zero clearance. So um, uh, the, 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 the importance of E antigen status uh, should be understood in the concept of uh, nature course of the patients, understanding the nature course of the patients. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Kao, I don't know, I think uh, the webinar is about to end. Right, correct. Uh, because yeah. it's, uh, to my, yeah, my clock is 8.58, right. so we have a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you want to add something. I, I just would like to, to, to thank uh, in a way the audience, the speakers, the nice discussion. Yeah. I, yeah. I really enjoy. Perhaps uh, we put the seed uh, 
of the general idea to start to change the name of immunotolerance. Uh, also, in, in, at, at the PASA, it would be nice to see whether there could be a, a discussion about that. I think it's something that, it, as Patrick has discussed, is, I think is important to perhaps put this, uh, let's say, this name uh, a little bit under scrutiny. Uh, and again, thank you to all the speakers. Professor Kao, if you want to add uh, some final remarks, has been great. Yes, I think uh, we have more to be discussed about the immunotolerant phase and the more studies, including the, the chronohepatocyte expansion, immune dysfunction, as well as HPV DNA degradations. It will be more uh, interesting to know more about uh, the clinical uh, significance of uh, these uh, biological changes and understand more about the HPV infection, I think we can cure the virus as early as possible. So I also thank Antonio uh, for calling the webinar with me and all the speakers and uh, the audience, and especially uh, Professor George Lau, with your attention. <laughs> I think it's nine o'clock. Yeah, it's, it's nine, yeah, okay. Goodbye to everybody. Thanks Thank again. You very Thank, much. You Thank you very much. much. Goodbye. Yeah, Thank nice you. Have a nice Thank weekend. Bye-bye. Great to you. Appreciate it. Thanks Thank again. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, Professor Lee. Thank you. Bye, Professor Lee. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.